I'm Van Sebastian, here with my co-host, S.A. Baz Collins, for this week's Written on the Edge Season 9, Episode 7 interview. We'll be talking with J.M. Redman and discussing her latest book. So, let's get to know our guest. J.M. Redman is the author of a mystery series featuring New Orleans private detective Michelle Mickey Knight. Her books have made the American Library Association GLBT Roundtable's 2013 Over the Rainbow List, the Over the Rainbow List, and have won a four-word gold first-place mystery award. And her book Law and Desire was an editor's choice of the San Francisco Chronicle and a recommended book on NPR's Fresh Air. Her books have been translated into Spanish, German, Dutch, Norwegian, and Hebrew. Redmond lives in a historic neighborhood in New Orleans at the edge of the area that flooded. Is there an update to that? Dun, 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 there dun. is an update to that. Yes. Uh, like I say, I moved uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, I, you know, I miss New Orleans. I love New Orleans. But uh, as I mentioned when we were talking, I, I ended up retiring from the job that I was doing down there. And it just made sense to um, uh, finally give up my beautiful little house in the Treme um, and move oh. elsewhere. Yeah. Well, so because this is our first talk with you, let's tell folks where that passion to write first came from, because it's a it's a process, but yes. a full series and a mystery series that takes work. Um, yes, it does. And it also takes luck and privilege. I mean, I let's be let's be honest about that. I was my parents were both college educated. They were both journalists. They both wanted to be writers and had the dreams in their, their younger years. But uh, I'm, I'm an older person, as you can tell. And my parents were uh, their lives were impacted by the Depression and the, and the first and the Second World War, of course. Um, and so they never got to get that dream of, of writing. They did pass it on. Um, you know, as children, we went to the library. That was what we did. Um, um, we loved reading mystery books, um, and, and my mother, as my mother died of cancer, but it was a slow uh, death. I took care of her for the last year, and one of the things we did together was I would read out loud to her and read her mysteries. And oh, wow. so that sort of that really got me. And what I like about mysteries is um, it's a genre, quote unquote. But you know, Hamlet is genre, um, but mysteries deal with justice. And they deal with loss and grief and they de deal with a society that's being torn apart. And the mystery kind of helps at least put a little piece of it back together again. Nice. Very nice. So let's talk about your series so that we can then talk about book 11. Yes. So tell me about Michelle Mickey Knight. Well, um, well I'll just hold up the cover right now because, you know, that, that's Beautiful. number 11. Transitory. Um, I... You know, in the in the early days, when I, I my first book was published in 1990, so I have been publishing uh, was one of the earlier uh, lesbian detective novels. Um, at that time, there was this huge kind of zeitgeist going on of you know recognizing that a lot of the mainstream publishers and mainstream bookstores would not be carrying queer literature. So there were there were uh, presses that were printing um, stuff: Firebrand, Nyad, um, uh, New Victoria, um, uh, you know, and some of the others, and there were all. Allison. Allison, yeah. Yes, yes. And that Allison, and yes. A huge number of them. I'm probably forgetting some of them. Um, but there are also a number of bookstores all around that were that were carrying this stuff and it created a kind of culture and a possibility that I think probably really hadn't been there before. And of course, I was also reading regular mysteries and uh Sarah Paretsky, Sue Grafton, and Marsha Muller suddenly yeah. broke open with the, the female PI and saying, Hey, you know, women can walk the mean streets too. And so I was like, Well, if women can walk the mean street, well, lesbians are women, so why not have them? And and it was sort of like I wanted to read a, the uh, a book that was a hard boiled, you know, sort of noirish PI, and then it became well, maybe if you want to read it, you're gonna need to be the one to write it. So I just started fooling, you know. I was really just, you know, in my uh, early 30s um, at that point, actually living in New York City, um, and I just thought, well, let me let me start fooling around, and I start what I thought would be a short story, and then I realized, oh, in that process, I'm not really a short story writer. I'm more of a novel writer, and that became my first book, Death by the Riverside, and I sort of shopped it around, and uh, one of the small presses picked it up, and they published that book, and my second book, Desa Jocasta, and that was sort of like, okay, that, that was when I realized, okay, I guess I'm going to be writing a mystery series. So tell me about your heroine, Mickey Knight. Um, she's a bit of an asshole. Can I say that on that? <laughs> well, um, you can. Um, 
And she, and I wanted her, I wanted her to be flawed. I wanted her to be messy because let's face it, human beings are messy. We do make, you know, even the good people still stumble and fall and aren't always perfect. And so I really wanted her to be uh, living a little bit on an edge so that the reader would hope, you know, be, be with her and say, well, I hope you don't fall off the edge and keeping up with the possibility that she would. So uh, one of the things that I had to do as I was writing the book was really ask myself, what would cause a woman, um, a lesbian, to decide to become a private detective? What kind of life do they live? And I realized that I would have to give her a bit of a backstory that is a difficult childhood, um, hopefully a realistic difficult childhood, um, that she is dealing with the things that you don't get as a child, if you don't get um, the kind of justice and fairness, oftentimes you you end up looking for it throughout your life. And so I created that. Um, she was a bit of a loner. Um, she wants friends, but is also scared of them because she's, uh, like I say, she had a hard childhood and learned not to really trust people too easily. Um, but, you know, one of the things about the books is her struggle to overcome the demons she was raised with um, to try and not only solve the cases and find justice for others, but to um, deal with herself. And, and for me, that was an interesting character. It was an interesting character because uh, of the flaws, because I knew I could have her screw up um, and you know, not always be perfect. Perfect. And, and, you know, because one of the questions for me is, you know, how do we find justice? Mm -hmm. You know, in real life, how do we find justice? You know, Superman, of course, can defeat Lex Luthor, and that's all great. Um, but in real life, how do flawed, imperfect people search for the right thing? How do they make the steps? Because sometimes the steps to doing the right thing is one small step, one small decision, and the steps to doing the wrong thing are the same thing, one small step and one small decision time after time. Nice. I have a question. So in, in your character's development over these books, the, the main central figure in all of these books, right? Yes. Okay. So you mentioned the trauma and stuff. Do any of the murders or things that happen play to those demons from her past that not yes. only is she trying to solve, but she's also dealing with those demons, yes. kind of confronting yes. them to face their her fear? Um, yes, definitely. You know, that played into it. And what I've tried to do and, and not do it so often that it's just it becomes a sort of, a, oh, that's what she's doing, is to have a lot of the cases parallel what's going on in um, Mickey's life. Um, you know, in uh, the first couple books, it's sort of her revealing what's going on and dealing with um, you know, that she had, uh, her father was killed when she was fairly young. She was, you know, taken in by a, an aunt and an uncle who were a bit on the pious religious side and didn't particularly appreciate um, a, a sort of rambunctious uh, tomboy from the bayous. Um, you know, I don't want to give away too much because I'm not right, right, right. But um, right. yeah, but but um, particularly um, in some of the later ones, uh, Law, the intersection of Law and Desire, which was the third book, um, and it was the one that was actually published by one of the big publishers in those burps when they said, "Oh, gay and lesbian is going to be the new best thing." Um, but it 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 um, for a lot of us, it, we ended up not selling enough books to stay with the big publishers. Um, but it very much dealt with you know how does she deal with what's going on in her life on um, her, the, the cases she has there is um, a young friend of hers, a young boy says he thinks something's going on with his sister. Um, and she, as he delves into that, she realizes um, that the sister is, is caught up in, in um, things she shouldn't be caught up in. And it, it parallels with what happened in Mickey's life and how does she deal with it? So, yeah, I, I do try and do that. I do think that that's one of the things that you don't, those various le levels of storytelling it, it's less interesting you know because we, we mm -hmm. come into stories about character we want to know these people we want to know what happens to them and we become invested in them and right. so yeah i mean i couldn't just i don't want to just ladle on you know oh she was um she had an abusive childhood and that's just sort of this backstory to her but it's it's things that's it's, it's ongoing in, in in her life you know past his prologue oh sure yeah, and well you know i was just thinking you know that's like great pulp to pull from when you're trying to develop the character over a series are those little onion skinning things that could be part of whatever case she's on, but, mm -hmm. you know, still play to weaknesses she may or flaws she may have to be dealing with yes. her demons, as you say, you know, and I just think that that can make 
for really good character development because you've got a real rich resource of texture to play with there. Right. Yeah. Um. And in the, in the fourth book, I actually lost daughters. Um. He, her mother disappeared when she was a young child, and she never knew why. She thought uh, she just mm -hmm. abandoned my child. And in Lost Daughter, she gets two cases of missing people that a uh, mother is looking to to find a daughter that they had thrown out because she was a lesbian. Um. And then another um young boy wants to find his mother, and so Mickey is doing these cases, and it starts to bring up in here. Well, what you know? Why don't I search? for my mother um mm -hmm. and so suddenly you become you have three cases really the two that she has taken on and also the one that she's finding the personal one yeah things. so if i can ask a question about her clientele which tells us a lot about her yeah. does she take on cases from people who have nowhere else to go does she work with the police uh, yeah, you know, that's the nice thing about fiction is you can sort of create the resources that you need. Um, and I think one of the things that, that we know about the, the uh, LGBTQ community, the uh, queer community, is that we often have our own networks. And mm -hmm. so uh, I've created for Mickey, she has uh, uh, two good friends of hers. One is... Um, uh, Assistant, assistant district attorney and another one is um a uh, new orleans police uh detective and they're all part of her uh, coterie of friends and so she can kind of work with them sometimes they remind her that she's uh you know not she's not police she's not official but oftentimes some of her things uh intersect with what they're doing and so she does have those, those to draw on um she takes cases in the first books, she's more like she takes any case that walks through the door because that's kind of where she is financially in terms of what she's doing. She's um, She's got an office in what was at that time sort of a down at heel, heel neighborhood in New Orleans. Uh, it has since become incredibly gentrified. Um, but so so anything that, you know, she said, you know, she I hate taking divorce cases. And as she moves on, she moves more into what uh, her specialty. And that's a lot of, she's a lot of missing people. Uh, she looks for people that, you know, you lost, you know, uh, uh, someone who has disappeared out of your life, not necessarily someone who is police worthy of missing child, uh, like a missing child. And so she does that. She also does um, some security work. And so those are the things that she kind of more specializes in. Um, obviously, still, sometimes things walk into um, her door and she's like, well, you know, this is not my favorite kind of person, but it's good money. And, you know, we all need money. Um, in transitory, for example, she has a very um, sort of uptight, uptown woman who decides that she needs to find the grandson who was kicked out of the family when he came out as gay um, some 10 or 15, you know, like 10 years ago. And so she hires Mickey to say, well, where, where is this person and how do I find her? Mickey doesn't particularly like this client, um, but, you know, her money is as green as anyone else's. So it, it's that balance of, you know, it's a real business and I have to treat it like, you know, she is a working person and she has to consider the financial things because let's face it, we all kind of do. Okay. Um, but also, you know, what are, the, what are the cases that I want to tell stories about? Nice. So the other thing about nice, gritty crime novels is the setting is usually its own character. Right. And you're a longtime resident of New Orleans. How yes. much did you pull the setting in as but not not just backdrop but actually like part of the story um uh, well a whole lot and um I, like I say, I lived in New Orleans for over 30 years, probably the longest time I'll ever lived in anywhere else. I actually was born um, about 90 miles to the east on the Mississippi Gulf Coast in a small town there. My father was a New Orleans native, and that's why we ended up back down there. So even in my childhood, we spent a lot of time traveling to New Orleans to see all our families. Um, if you look at the, you know, when I lived in New York, I was the only R-E-D-M-A-N-N -N in the Manhattan phone directory. But if you go to New Orleans, you'll find about, a, a, you know, well, they don't have, you know, yellow pages or, or white pages anymore. But, right. you know, you can find about a big inch of, uh, you know, the uh, R-E-D-M-A-N-Ns because, you know, big Catholic families that came through. Mm. So related to a lot of people in there. And, you know, um, so New Orleans was always this, this big city. You know, I knew fairly early on that probably small town Mississippi was just not the place I wanted to end up. And so New Orleans became kind of this, this place away, this, the first oasis where it was different. You know, you go to the French quarter and you'd see, you know, all these different people. And, and I didn't, you know, it took me a while to figure out that I was queer um, because I grew up in a small town in Mississippi at that time. Um, 
but I knew that I needed to get out. So New Orleans has always been sort of in, in my life. And then of course, like I say, I moved there in 1989 and lived there until uh, 2022. And I did have a day job. Um, most of us writers do. And my day job was in public health, working in HIV AIDS prevention. And I, um, you know, a lot of my particular role was writing grants and doing meetings and writing reports and all that sort of stuff and talking to project officers. Um, but also we worked in a lot of neighborhoods that really aren't tourist neighborhoods um, mm -hmm. because we wanted to meet the people that, you know, the tourists, mm -hmm. yeah, they had money to go to hotels. Um, mm -hmm. So I got to see a kind of a New Orleans that probably, you know, even some residents don't get to see. Um, and when I lived, when I moved into my neighborhood that I, I lived for the last 20 years in my uh, house on, in for May, when I first moved there, people were like, oh, are you sure you want to live there? That's not a good neighborhood. Of course, now it's gentrified. Thank you very much, David Simon, for creating Treme. Um, They now have film tour, tour groups walking through the neighborhood. And I'm like, oh, it's gone. It's gone when they're there. They're going, and they filmed this here. Um, mm -hmm. But it was, it was a fascinating place to live and really you know, just a slice of New Orleans. We had second lines coming down the street. Um, yeah, so I, yes, I've definitely had to, you have to get New Orleans right because it's such a quirky city. It's such a weird city. Well, it's and iconic, course, like like New York, yeah. like Chicago, like San Francisco, you know. Yes. They all have yeah. their yes. ambiance that is character, you know. Exactly, exactly. And, and of course, um, you know, I was living in New Orleans when Katrina hit, and mm -hmm. I realized that the, um, all my characters had to go through Katrina because everybody in New Orleans uh, went through something in Katrina, some, some you know, huge traumatic event. You were flooded, you were evacuated, you were, you were whatever. And so I had to think, you know, what happened to my particular characters in that, and how do I get Katrina right because of course I had my particular experience but my particular experience was just mine um mm -hmm. and it wasn't a, a broad swath of what happened to everybody there so it actually the uh, book that I wrote I was in the middle of writing death of a dying man um which is about a man who is uh, HIV positive but doing well but has hepatitis and this was, of course, before the hepatitis, the hepatitis C drugs came out and really were effective. And, you know, so he was already starting to die. But why he was killed? Why would you kill a dying man? Um, but anyway, so in the middle, when I was in the middle of writing that book, that's when Katrina happened. And suddenly I had this dilemma of do I write a novel that is by default historical? In other words, it's set pre-Katrina. Do mm -hmm. I write a novel that is or do I deal with it being uh, it? you know, what's happened to Katrina, you know, what would have happened to all my characters if Katrina had happened, you know, like it did right in the middle of the book, what would they have been doing with their lives? Um, and I finally made the decision I, I needed to do that. I needed to um, almost bear witness to what yeah, well, happened. It's, it's mm -hmm. really weird because I think as authors, whether you try to make it of its time, it will be of its time because the vernacular is yes. very specific, uh -huh. you yes. know, so characters behave in a certain way. They're dealing with certain technologies or or yes. not dealing with technologies, you know. So it's like you almost have as an author, you almost have to just let go and tell the story that you want to tell because, exactly. you know, you can't do the great Gatsby now. You know, no. in the way that it was done then, you know, because it was of its time, you know, but in a way that's beautiful about it, because as a reader, you can go back to that time, you know, right. so people like I was alive when Katrina hit, I saw all the news things, but it would be really fascinating to me to actually just go there and, and you know, and, and your book and actually live it from inside the novel to see what that experience was like, you know. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes. Um, yeah. And so I had to actually follow through for a couple of books. I mean, Death of a Dying Man was during when Katrina happened and and sort of the immediate aftermath. And the book after that, Watermark, um, was about coming back to New Orleans, you know, after the after the cameras left and after, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I was back there. I was living in New Orleans. My house um, did not flood. I, I lived in one of the uh, so-called high areas that the water was in the street. I could see where it hit cars, but it had not gotten into my house. And, you know, I was incredibly lucky. The worst thing that happened to me was somebody broke in and they stole my really good scotch. Um, <laughs> it, you know, and he came they might have needed it with as bad as the weather was. <laughs> yeah. 
Scott they needed a good stiff one. <laughs> yeah, they probably did. Bless them. You know, I, I hope they enjoyed it. I hope it did them really good. Um, oh. you, you know, so again, I had to write what happens after, what happens, you know, um, when you're dealing with this huge rebuilding, this huge reconstruction, this huge trauma. There was literally, um, you know, a lot of uh, trauma in people. You know, uh, my partner um, came down there. She had a sabbatical in, in uh, about three years after that. And that's when uh, Hurricane Gustav came through. And so they were like, well, we need to. And she said she watched us all just sort of going through, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And fortunately, it was not another Katrina. Um, it was, you know, not a great hurricane. Um, but again, you know, what does it do to a population, to a people going through that? And mm -hmm. I, I felt, you know, what, you know, again, my characters are going to be going through this. And and so it's up to me to witness, um, you know, all the places that were devastated because there were huge parts of New Orleans. Again, not the pe places that the tourists see, um, you know, the French Quarter and stuff was fine, but some of the, of the other places that had just been, uh, you know, I remember going down to the lower ninth ward and it looked like literally bombs and bombs and bombs. You houses were taken off their foundations and washed three or four uh, blocks away. Cars were up in trees. It was just haunting. And as a writer, I wanted to, as best I could, with just words on a page, convey how haunting that was for all the mm. people living there. Mm. Right. So moving on to your most recent novel, uh, Transitory's book 11. 11, yes. And I know you mentioned the um, client a little bit. Is there more about the novel you want to share with people without spoiling it? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the it opens with the scene of, um, you know, I dealt very lightly with the COVID pandemic saying that Mickey, you know, we're finally starting to get, go back to, to places and Mickey went back to one of her favorite bars and hung out with people. And she's a little bit not as sober as she should be. And she's stumbling home from the French Quarter bar to her house, which is about you know seven or eight blocks away and as she's crossing uh one of the the new the the uh, dividing line between the french quarter and the treme which is a four uh a fairly fast four lane road she sees uh a woman being pushed out of a car and then the next car behind it running over her and uh killing her basically and and so mickey of course is involved because she's there she's got to call 911 she's got to stop and and try and stop traffic and you know she's she's there with a woman and she sees her being killed and uh the cops say well hang out because we want to talk to you you know you're the witness and, and as she hears him starting to talk about this victim and they're saying he because it's a transgender woman and the cops are clearly, you know, not exactly as enlightened as they should right, be. Right. And mm -hmm. so Mickey is caught in that she's, you know, she's a woman of a certain age. She's wearing, I think, uh, a T-shirt that doesn't indicate that she is um, exactly as straight as she should, as cops might like. And so she has to get in that caught that moment of um, does she try and tell the cops? No, that was. That's not a sex worker. The woman looks kind of like a librarian. Um, she's clearly just a transgender woman trying to live her life and the cops make their assumptions. And so she's caught in this, should I just keep walking on? And, you know, I did what I did. I gave my information and the cops are probably going to blow it off as a sex worker who was surprised a client. Or does Mickey get involved in this? Um, and then, of course, she gets again the, the case with the looking for the grandson. Um, and, and the ways that they, they intersect. And what I wanted to focus on in, in this book was community and the way particularly those of us who are left out of many of the mainstream institutions. So, you know, one of the things that Mickey deals with in this particular book is the fact that transgender people, and particularly African-American transgender people or queer people in general, don't always trust the police. Yeah. The police mm -hmm. aren't always justice for them. Right. The police often are the worst. For good reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so how does she work with to try and get justice when it's so elusive for um, some communities to find justice? Um, and, and so that's sort of it. And also it, I want to talk about, you know, things that we all transition, we all change. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes the ones that are normal are just accepted. The fact like we get older, you know, mm -hmm. that our bodies change. We're not, you know, sadly, we're not the people we were at 25. Sure. And how we stigmatize trans transitions that are not considered normal and that, that they they really should be. It's it, We all change. Wow. Powerful. 
All right. Well, I know we're coming up on time here. Do you have anything else you want folks to know about it before we move on to our get to know you questions? Um, you know, buy books. Uh, it would be great if you bought my books, but please support uh, support uh the people who don't get published by the mainstream or not as often as they should, you know, there are some really great mystery novels. Uh, check out crime writers of color, check out uh, queer crime writers. They have lots of lists of stuff and, you know, you can, the books are there. Um, sometimes you have to look a little bit for them, but um, you can find these books and some of them are really, really great crime novels. Yes. Amen. All right. Take it away, Baz. All right. So in this year of diving deeper, what is your favorite writing snack or drink? Um, well, I do like a good scotch, but I don't <laughs> usually drink that while I am writing. Um, you know, I, I don't not a big snacker while I'm writing. You know, you, you don't want to get, you know, the little cheese puff things on your fingers. When well, you're yeah. Um, mm. and, you know, um, you know, maybe I have a, a little thing of nuts and if I'm really sort of nibblish, I, I will uh, eat a little bit of that. That's about it. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Well, what books did you read growing up? Oh my God. I read cereal packages. I read, um, everything. <laughs> um, Girl, same. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Back of cereal boxes. Yeah. Reader's Digest, whatever was handy. Yeah, yeah, which is better, Cheerios or Rice Krispies, which is more right, vivid. right. Yeah, <laughs> I was oh, big I, on I, Apple Jacks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, like I said, we went to the library a lot. Uh huh. Um, you know, so a lot of books, of course. You know, the the Hardy Boys, the Nancy Drew books, mm -hmm. um, that sort of stuff, the mystery books. Um, I started reading Jane Austen fairly early, and I know that's kind of weird. Why is a lesbian reading, you know, one of the quintessential romance authors? But if you read her carefully, she is so snarky. Mm -hmm. uh, she's wonderfully snarky, and I really love her because she manages what one of the most difficult things to do in writing, I think, which is a believable happy end. Um, and then, of course, I started getting into, you know, some of the great mystery writers, Nigel Marsh, um, uh, Agatha Christie, of course, um, you know, uh, all the great ones, um, yeah, P.D. James. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, some of the early lesbian writers that really influenced me, um, Catherine Forrest, um, Ellen Hart, um, you know, um, uh, Barbara Wilson, the ones that said, oh, wow, we're doing this. And so there's a possibility to do that. And it's those opening doors. And that's what books do is they really, they open so many doors for me and so many other people. That part right there. All right. Yep. Well, who's been the biggest supporter of your writing? Um, I, there are many. There are many. Um, certainly my wife, Jillian, um, professor of musicology at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, she is, fortunately for me, she possesses one of those really annoying um, superpowers, which is she can read things so quickly, uh, which is good <laughs> for her in terms of what she's reading. But I can say, honey, could you please just read this manuscript and check it? And, she, and, and two days later, she says, here, it's back. I made all these marks and I'm like, you know, so I don't feel like I'm really asking her to give me three or four days to read um, a first draft or really. A <laughs> right. She's all here, eat this sandwich. I'll be done in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, a huge number of other people, um, Greg Heron, who is a really good friend of mine, you know, we actually work together. We worked at the same organization. He's also a mystery writer in New Orleans. Um, and we used to joke that we were um, we had sort of a mutually assured destruction pact because he worked in my department. I was his boss's boss. But for a while, he was also my personal trainer, but he was also my editor. So if he did something to me that I didn't like, I could fire him. But he could also, you know, make me work out really hard. Or Right, you know, right, right. There was, as with all things, there's a balance. <laughs> all, things, <laughs> all right. Are you a morning person or a night owl? Oh, night owl. Absolutely. 100 percent. Night owl. Same, same, same. I feel you. <laughs> He's the morning person. <laughs> yeah, somebody's got to be. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Well, what's your favorite hobby outside of writing? I'm sorry, what? What's your favorite hobby outside of writing? Oh, reading. But that's really part of writing because you have to yeah. read to write. Um, I would... Some cooking, some traveling. Uh making sure the cats get played with every single day because they're cats and uh, they have learned to follow me where we keep the toys and kind of have this expected look at me like you're going to play with this aren't you mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, that's about it. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Has writing and publishing a book changed the way you see yourself? Um, yes. You know, it's, it's given me insight into what it takes to create a book and, and the amount of time and effort it does. It's also given me insight into, you know, when you're outside, you know, I talk to new writers like, oh my God, I just want to be published, all this sort of stuff. And it's like, yeah, you get published, but then what do you do? What's the next step? Yeah. What's <laughs> after that? How do you create it, it? It becomes this, oh, okay, I've been published. And I am, you know, incredibly lucky. And like I say, well, lucky, privileged. I've been published. You know, uh, I've had uh, books published by some of the, the big publishers. It, it didn't last. It's gone away. I'm still, but I'm still lucky. I'm published by a, uh, you know, fairly large uh, LGBTQ publisher. I, you know, I can't complain too much. And it's like, do you want to, publish a book or do you want to be a writer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely the two are very different all right if you were to write a spin-off about a side character of your novels which would you pick uh probably i would go with joe ann ranson she is the uh new orleans police detective that mickey works with okay okay have you ever traveled as research for your book well, I've traveled and used it uh, to research books. It, it, it's, um, you know, certainly in New Orleans, I uh, traveled, uh, drove around. You know, one of the things that when I, my third book, The Intersection of Law and Desire, there is a law street. There is a desire street. They do actually intersect. Wow. Um, at that time, it was in a really, really not considered not good neighborhood so i'm like well i really do have to drive there and so we got in the car and just drove you know to the intersection of law and desire and um you know i totally made it up in my book i'd already written part of the book by the time i did this and then i realized that oh there is a bar there because i put a bar there and i'm thinking i hope god i hope no one in that bar ever reads my book because i made it as a not nice bar um <laughs> Yeah, I did have Mickey run off to Australia once because I'd gone off to Australia. Uh, my partner's actually Australian, um, so it's not that weird. And I just said, you know, I can I can have her be in Australia, and then I can take off a little bit yeah, for tax purposes. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, finally, how do you celebrate when you finish a book? Um, there's that good scotch. <laughs> That's nice. where the scotch comes in. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, usually, well, it's. And, and finishing book is always sort of ambiguous. It's, it's a bit like gay relationships. When did you get together? When did you get married? You know, when is a, you don't have necessarily a firm date where you just made the decision because uh, oftentimes we couldn't uh, early on. But anyway, you, you finish the first draft and then you mm. have to write the second draft and then go through it. Mm -hmm. And then you get it good enough that you give it to your editor. Then you've got your edits and they go through it. And then you've got the, the, um, the page proofs and then you've got the galley proofs. And by the time it comes out in an actual book, it's like, you're so tired of it. <laughs> but, you know, but, but the other thing too, is you can say, okay, first draft, you know, nice, nice scotch, you know, first edit, nice scotch. You can do scotch. After <laughs> right. Well, there you go. There you go. And that's why you have to have good stuff. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. See? All right. Well, you made it through the list. Bravo. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was a nice list. So what's coming up next for you? Are you writing book 12? Are you doing any appearances? Uh, yes, I am. I am working on book 12. Mm -hmm. I'm also working on another book um, because I'm retired now. I have more time. Um, uh, also set in New Orleans and featuring the main character is a, a, someone who works as a drag queen. That's his profession. Um, mm. I, I have a friend, a really good friend of mine who is is doing that and he's sort of helping me with it because I wanted to try something else. But yes, I am also working on Mickey Knight uh, number 12, which is the current title of it. Um, I will be at the Saints and Sinners Literary Festival at the end Bravo. of March. Bravo, yay. Nice. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm a little biased because I was one of the people that helped launch it way back in the in the day. But it's really, I think, one of the best queer uh, writing festivals around. And plus, it's in a hotel in New Orleans in the French Quarter. So you, you can't miss. Can't uh, get better I, than that. No, you cannot do better than that. Um, and in, in, in late March in New Orleans is beautiful weather. 
Um, just, just, just saying for all, all of us up in the north now. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I do have some online stuff on February the twenty fourth. I'm going to be with the Curve community with uh, two other great authors, Barbara Wilson, who was one of my uh, heroes in terms of you know, writing the first lesbian mysteries, and also Terry Wolverton, who is a longtime writer and has done some fabulous stuff. Um, at the end of May, we're going to do something with Sinister Wisdom. I don't have the date yet. I'm going to put it up on my website soon. Again, an online forum, and, and I'm going to be appearing at. The the Golden Crown Literary uh, Conference in uh, early uh, July in uh, Minneapolis. So two nice. uh, online appearances and two actually, I'm going to actually be there appearances. Nice. And folks should know that www.jmredman with two ends at the end.com is your site. So they can keep up with those and get the, the updates for when you actually have those dates. Do you have any final words of wisdom? Um, first of all, thank you all very much because the community of readers and writers depends on people like you and your volunteer effort. And again, also, um, please read. Read books. It makes such a difference. It takes you to so many worlds. And it's cheaper than traveling on a plane. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. And you can choose your companion sitting you've next re- to you. have reduced your carbon there you go. at the same time. <laughs> All right, folks, we'd like to extend a huge thank you to J.M. Redman for joining us. Jane, thank you so much. Yes. And we at Written on the Edge are proud to introduce you to new media by queer content creators. So if you enjoy learning about new artists or hearing our thoughts on entertainment media, please like and subscribe so you get the alerts for new episodes. This show was produced by Rogue Ravens Media. For our disclaimers, links to social media, our listening stations, or to sign up as a guest, visit www.rotepodcast.com. Tune in next week for your queer media fix. Closing time. The bums rush in melody, dear.